Hey Chapel Street Church, so glad you could join us in worship today. We have a few things that we wanted to share with you. First, our next opportunity for baptism is coming up on Sunday, September 8th. We believe that baptism is a big deal, an opportunity for those of us who are following Jesus to signify our faith, to make a declaration to our church family about what God has done in our lives, an outward expression of an inward work. If you haven't been baptized yet, now is the time. You can learn more at chapelstreet.church slash baptism. One of the values we have here at Chapel Street is community. We believe that following Jesus is not something that you do alone, that we all need people walking alongside us in the ups and the downs of life. That's why we offer a variety of care groups, which are relaunching very soon. Our care groups offer a variety of support for things like divorce care, sexual integrity, personal development, grief share, and addiction and recovery. Don't make the mistake of trying to go through life on your own. Learn more at chapelstreet.church care. We're also just a few weeks away from the launch of our fall session of Rooted, coming up on September 8th. Rooted is a 10-week small group experience that is intentionally created to help you connect with God, your purpose, and the church. Hundreds of Chapel Streeters have gone through Rooted and have found friendships and a deeper connection with God. Check out what Steve has to say about his journey through Rooted. It's funny how Rooted started for us because we had seen at least two seasons of Rooted had gone by before we decided to, to join Rooted. And it was one of those things where, it, like, any, like anything in life, and everyone has done this with not just church-related stuff, but anything in life, we would, we'd be watching the video, and the video would be on, and like, we'd look at each other and we'd be like, we should do that. And then we'd look back, and then we just wouldn't do it. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like that's just it's just how it is. Like people just do that. And so it took about two two seasons for us to do it. And finally we just we just really decided that we needed to jump in. We wanted to meet new people in the church. We wanted to just really get to know our church family. We had never done Bible studies or anything like that. So this was a way for us to really move forward in our faith and move forward in our walk. And we're like what what better time to do it than now it's been great because we have met so many new people and we have gotten close to so many people at church and it's just to get to know the people at church is is really makes going there so much better i love these people they are the people who would do anything to get me closer to christ how many of you thought that way we should do that and we just don't do it i've got a long list of those things in my life but i should do that and not do it Steve is, uh, works on our safety and security team. Uh, he's a big, tall fellow in the back. You've probably seen him here. And he does corrections for a living, so I feel safer with Steve around. And I'm glad he's here. One other quick announcement. Uh, so those of you that are, are members or regular tenders, and if you're regular contributors financially to the mission of God here, we're so thankful for you. I want to remind you, our fiscal year ends at the end of this month, August. And I just want you just to say thank you for being so consistently faithful and generous to what God is doing here uh, as we finish up this year and plan uh, for the next year. Let's bow in prayer and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father God, you are good, and we've been singing your praises about who you are, and it's good as we do that. As we lift our voices in song, your, your spirit reminds us that you're God and that we belong to you. And now as we come to your word, uh, we pray that you would speak to us. You've told us your word is living and active and able to penetrate hearts, and so we ask you to do that for us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Today we begin a four-week new series uh, on the church uh, called what, what is the Church? Which might sound like an obvious question. We're here in church, but what is it we're doing here when we gather? What is this thing we call the church? What is it we're really a part of? Uh, so four weeks from the New Testament images and metaphors and descriptors of what the church is. Um, you're, you've probably heard or seen, there's lots of articles and uh, lots of buzz and news right now about the church is in decline in America. Uh, attendance is down, people are questioning the, its, its relevance. Uh, less than 50% of U.S. adults believe the church is relevant in the world today. Only 27% believe the local churches in their community are making a positive impact. Um, and so there's a lot of data about this and a lot of hand-wringing among Christians and what's happening to this, you know. I read a book last summer called The Great De-Churching. You'll see a quote here on the screen from this book. Uh, Jim Davis uh, writes this, 
For the first time in eight decades that Gallup has tracked American religious membership, more adults in the United States do not attend church than attend church. Now, of course, attending doesn't make you a Christian, but it's a significant tr downward trend line. Uh, uh, interestingly, in their, in their sociological research, they, they uh, reveal that 40 million Americans have stopped attending or de-churched in the last 25 years, 40 million. That includes Catholics, Protestants, mainline, evangelical, all denominations. And we would be in that evangelical camp, which is interesting, 40 million. And if your social media feed or your news feed or your, what, the information you consume is on the left side, uh, liberal, progressive leaning, the narrative you're being told about this is largely this is because the church pastoral abuse scandals, pastoral moral failures, financial impropriety, uh, that they're misogynistic, homophobic, and racist. And it's a good thing generally that we're not part of those churches anymore. If your news consumption is largely on the right, conservative side, the narrative you're being told about this is that, well, this is because of the attack on the nuclear family, the, our culture no longer value, has Judeo-Christian values, and this is to be expected when those things are being torn down, people wouldn't want to be part of the church. There's truth on both sides. But of the 40 million, 18 million of those who are evangelical churches like ours, that stopped, that de-churched, do you know that 90% of the reason they stopped going to church it's not this, and it's not this. It's really boring reasons. It's we moved, we changed jobs, our kids got busy, and we just stopped going. The number one reason people de-church is, is not uh, the stuff you hear about all the time. It's life. Life happens. Life gets in the way. And 90% of them say they still believe in Jesus and, would, and are favorable to coming back if asked. I bring that up just to say that with all the angst in the culture about Christianity and the church, there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful too. We just don't hear about it very much. There's a lot that God is doing. Barna Research uh, did a in, uh, study of church dropouts and uh, cited the increase from 59% in 2011 to 64% in 2019. Well, if we just forward that to eight years, that's 2027. Three years from now, where will we be? Um, there's something worth thinking about. That the, our culture is asking the question, who needs the church? Who really needs it? Is it good? But, but to answer that question, we should ask the question, well, what is it? What are we actually a part of? What is the church? What did Jesus have in mind when he said in Matthew, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail? Whatever it is, he seems to care about it and be involved in it, and it's going to last. What is it, then? Is it a service you attend? Is it a location geographically? Is it a campus? Is it a program? What are we a part of? The Greek word most often translated church is the Greek word ekklesia. The root word there is kaleo, meaning to call out. And it, it meant in, in non-biblical writings in the first century Greek world, it meant uh, assembly or gathering, those who were called to assemble for a particular purpose. The New Testament authors meant by this, those called out by God to be his unique people in the world. The ecclesia. And there's really no place in the Bible that gives us a bullet point definition. What we get are lots of powerful descriptions. And we're gonna look at four of them. Four metaphors or images from the New Testament of the church. Four uh, images that the New Testament writers use to describe what this is. The body, that's this week. The bride, next week. The building, not bricks and mortar, but his people. And then the priesthood. There are more images, but those are the ones we've chosen for this series. So that we know what it is we're participating in when we say we're going to church. So if you've got your Bible, we're gonna look at the body image. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can follow along in your own Bible or on the screen as I read from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27. A little background before we jump into this text. Uh, chapter 12 begins, Paul didn't write with chapters, obviously. This is a letter he wrote to a group, a church in the city of Corinth. And he is, this section is addressing spiritual gifts. In fact, he begins the verse 1 of chapter 12 with, uh, now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. We're not going to have time to get into spiritual gifts. We've preached on those before. Maybe you're curious or interested. We've talked about that many times before. But he's talking about the gifts God gives people to be used to build up the body. And I want to focus on the body metaphor here, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we're all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. 
If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, we are, are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Man, we could spend a lot of time on that passage. This is really rich. Um, there's so much happening in it. When you, when you, in general, when you trust in Jesus Christ, do you do that individually? You make an individual response to the offer of grace and forgiveness. And God, when you do that, you realize God has been drawing you all along. And when you trust in him, when you place your trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you surrender your life to him, doesn't mean you're perfect, but you, he's now Lord of your life. What the, Paul is saying is you become part of something. You're saved individually, but you're saved into a community, the body. You are attached to Christ and to other people who have made the same decision. We're now attached to each other and to Christ, part of the body. We're baptized, he says, into one spirit with one Lord. We all get a new identity. Like we're all, we're all getting, it, it's, it's football season, I get very excited. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic this year about the Bears, right? But it's like we all get new jerseys, Team Jesus jersey. We all, we're all on the same team now. We all get, a, we're, we are part of something. It's profound what he's saying. And when you, when you really begin to grasp what it means to be part of the body of Christ, it directly challenges what we grow up, sort of the air we grow up breathing in America, individualism. We ask kids, what do you wanna be when you grow up? We think about our dreams and our hopes and our plans and my agenda and my desires and how it's going in my life. To be part of the body of Christ means there's a new agenda. I'm, I'm a part of a body, now I'm the, I'm the agent of another mind. I'm working for, as part of his body, and you are, and we are, his agenda, his desire, his hopes, his dreams in the world, not just my own. I wanna look at four aspects of what it means from this passage to be part of the body of Christ. There are more, but we have time for these four that I think are crucial for us. First, I've already alluded to this, to be part of the body of Christ means we are part of something greater than ourselves. You're part of something greater and bigger than you. You should want something in your life that's greater than you. People who aren't even Christians, we have this innate desire to connect to something, to a community, to, to achieve some purpose together. It's in us to want that. And Jesus says, yes, that, that seed, that desire is ultimately fulfilled when you come to me and you become part of my body. We now function as part of his agenda, not our own. Look at verses 12 and 13 again of the text. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with, what would you think he would say if you didn't see it? You'd see, think he'd say church, wouldn't you? So it is with the church, so it is with you. What does he say? So it is with Christ. That's interesting. For just as the body is one as many members, like your physical body and mine, so it is with the church. No, so it is with Christ. This is his point. We are his body. For in one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all are made to drink of one spirit. We are his body. We are to function according to his purpose, will, led by his spirit. So in other words, you don't join a church to improve your spiritual life will improve your spiritual life, but you don't join a church to do that. 
You don't join a church because it's part of your religious agenda, because you think it's a good thing that you need in your life. You're already pretty full, but missing a little something suburban life. In fact, according to the New Testament, you don't join a church at all. You're called by God, respond to his grace, and then you're made a part of his body. It happens to you. I want you to recognize that what Paul's, Paul's words to the Corinthians really is God's word to us this morning. God's word to us, Chapel Street, as part of his body, this local expression of his body in the world, all who belong to Jesus. And keep in mind, Paul's writing to a church, to a group of Christians. We, we can't help but read things individually. We think and read individualistically. So whenever you see a you in Paul's letters, it's not you individually, it's not just you. It's if Paul were from the South in America, it'd be all y'all. His you means y'all. It's a corporate, a collective plural you he's writing to. In fact, you, you cannot be the church on your own. Maybe you've seen this t-shirt slogan. I've seen it on bumper stickers and t-shirts. I am the church. Have you seen this? I've seen this before. It might make for a good t-shirt slogan. It's terrible theology. You're not the church. That's kind of Paul's point. You can't be. It's not possible for you to be the church. You'd just be like a big toe or an ear by yourself. It wouldn't make any sense, is Paul's point. You need the other members of the body to be the body of Christ. But we, we I've seen this, and I, I know this is a temptation. It's possible for you to Google and YouTube the best preaching, the best worship, the best devotional materials, and cobble together DIY your own spirituality and think you can be a little island unto yourself spiritually. That might be possible in contemporary America, but it's not at all the New Testament vision for what it means to belong to Jesus. He is the head, Paul tells us in Ephesians. In him, the whole body is joined together, held together, and grows. And yet, being part of the body does not mean you stop being you. To be, to be part of something bigger than yourself doesn't mean you lose your individual uniqueness. It doesn't mean that you stop being the unique person God made in his image. To, to bear his image and reflect his glory in the world. This is the second point. We are all needed and all have a part to play in the body of Christ. You don't cease to be you when you come to Christ and are made part of his body. In fact, what you discover is you become more you than you could possibly be in isolation. You become more the person God intended you to be in community with other believers than you could be on your own. You think... Do you think you can know your true identity by yourself? Just you and your Bible and your own thoughts? No, not according to scripture. You need other members of the body to be the you God made you to be. Look at verses 14 through 20. Now, now I find this part of Paul's letter, uh, I don't know the Apostle Paul, someday I'll meet him and I'm gonna ask him. But I wonder, I don't know if he had a sense of humor. I think so, I like to think so. Um, this part, I can't help but thinking he's making this point, but he's having a little bit of fun doing it. Let's look at it. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, well, how would a foot talk, right? But if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, when I read that, I think of Mike from Monsters, Inc., you know, like Mike Sikowski, whatever the guy's name. Where would the sense of, be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, I, I don't know, I, I just gotta draw this. Right? If the whole body were an ear, like what would that look like? I don't know, maybe like this. It'd be weird. And you could hear very well, but that'd be about it, right? the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged, don't miss that, as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. And he doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't get it wrong. If you're part of his body, he arranged it, he chose it. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts yet one body. The church is, is uh, now part of what the church in Corinth was wrestling with was this hierarchy that, uh, based on spiritual gifts. 
One of their issues, of course, that would never be an issue, you know, favoritism or hierarchy in the church in America, but in the first century Corinth, they, they valued certain gifts above others. They looked at certain upfront gifts, preaching, prophecy, and so on, as most important. And the problem with that is you can't separate the gift from the one using the gift. And so over time, they had this sort of hierarchy of valuing certain people who had certain gifts over others. And Paul is saying, you're missing entirely God's vision. The church is never built on a few unique gifts or unique individuals who have those gifts. It's built on Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks when we get to building. It's built on the foundation of Christ. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of, what? One another, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, whatever God gave you, whatever that is, use it for his purpose and his glory. He doesn't make mistakes. And you might be thinking, well, he didn't give me that much. Well, you're probably wrong about that, but whatever he gave you is needed. Maybe you're thinking, well, I'm just, I'm just like the big toe of the, of the body. Well, we need a big toe, actually two of them. <laughs> the point Paul's making is all are needed, all have a part to play, to bring our, our, the best of who we are. And I, I wanna, for most of my life, even as a pastor, I've assumed and thought about this in terms of the gifts God has given me Use them to the very best of my ability. Like, bring the best of who I am to preaching the word, to leadership, to pastoring. The best of who you are. And I think that's true. It's not like you want to give God your half-hearted attempt. But I've been thinking about this differently lately. What about the parts of us in the body that we don't feel best about? What about the parts of us that are weak? What about the parts of us that are broken or that we're a little bit ashamed of or we don't want people to see? What about the parts of us that we we deeply regret? You got those parts? What, What use is there for those in the body of Christ? Could God use your weakness or your brokenness? You think, think is, it, is, there, is there any use for your past trauma? For your biggest screw up? I've come to see that I I think God wants our best efforts, but he also wants the stuff that feels weak and that we don't really want, we don't know what to do with. I think under the beauty of God's grace, he can redeem even that. Some of you know Jenny Caterer. Jenny was my assistant uh, for, for a number of years, a dear friend, many of us know and love her. Jenny, if you don't know her story, in fact, if you follow Jenny on Facebook, if you don't, you should. Go watch, she's posted a link to a message she gave at her brother's church in Minnesota about her own journey. So many times, and she's the perfect example of this, I've seen people go through deep, dark holes. And in the moment you think, what possible good or use is there for this? Jenny's cancer um, diagnosis on the wake, uh, on the heels of bringing a very high-risk pregnancy, a little girl into the world, thinking she's not gonna live to see her daughter's first or second birthday, paralysis, chemotherapy, like it was ugly. And yet... If you go listen and watch that, her message, God's using it. And maybe you're going through something right now and you feel like, I have nothing to offer. It might be the thing you think (laughs) is is pointless or hopeless. And you don't even have to be through it for God to use it. You might be just a few steps further down the path than somebody else who's in a dark hole. That's happened in my life where people have encouraged me. God wants to use all of it, all the parts of the body. What does he say? Those that we think are weaker, he says are indispensable. This means whatever your past experience is, whatever you may think about yourself, everyone is needed. Everyone has a part to play. And that brings us to the third point. Our health is connected to the health of the other members of the body. Your spiritual health and vitality is not independent and solely up to you. It's connected, of course, to the work of Christ, but the other members of his body, Paul said in Romans 12, 5, right? We are members of not just him, but one another. We are connected to each other. 
Have you ever had an issue with one part of your physical body that you left unattended and affected the rest of your body? Anybody ever have that? No, just me? Yeah, yeah. You ever have something that you don't deal with and it causes, like I've got this bad knee, which I'm just pretending isn't bad, and it's getting worse. I know I need to have a cortisone shot, probably surgery, maybe knee replacement soon. Um, and I'm just pretending like it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt, but I'm walking funny, now my hip hurts, now my shoulder's out of whack, I don't sleep well, right? Eventually you leave stuff unattended, it affects the rest of your body. Paul's saying spiritually speaking, that's how it works. We're connected to each other. Look again at what he says in verses 21 through 27. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. There it is. The parts that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, we treat with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts don't require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. Here's here's the purpose statement he's talking about right here. That there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you, y'all, are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is such an important point here. You ever, you ever talk to somebody who's really struggling and you say something like, I'm so sorry, and you mean it, and I'll pray for you, and then you walk away and forget all about it? I have. You ever hear about somebody in the, in, that's, that's a Christian friend of yours that's doing really well, succeeding, flourishing, and you feel sort of resentful? Maybe you're struggling and you think, why them? Why not me? Paul's saying, we're connected to each other. We, ce- we should celebrate when something goes well for a brother or a sister. Because it's, it's our body. I'm part of the body of Christ. That means part of the body of Christ is flourishing. Praise God. And we should struggle and suffer and feel it when one of our brothers or sisters, parts of the body, suffers. That's part of the body of Christ that's suffering. We are so connected to one another. This is the application point, no division. And by the way, no division doesn't mean we all agree on, unity in the body doesn't mean uniformity of thought. It doesn't mean everyone always agrees about everything. And I can tell you uh, by the emails that I receive from many of you that we don't here. And that's a good thing, that's okay. It means the things that we, like our, our debates about what's happening in our society, our ideologies, our views about the economy, education, whatever. It means we are not dismembered because of those things. We're not pulled apart from each other because of those things. We're connected to the body. And if we let that dismember us, we lose our source of life. Like like if you cut off a hand, that's kind of gruesome, but if you did, does that hand have its life of its own? Does it live a little hand life, walking around, pointing at things, giving a thumbs up by itself? No, I mean, maybe in the Adams family it does, but it doesn't actually do that, right? It withers and dies because it's been dismembered. Paul's saying that's how it's to be with my people. Your spiritual vitality is connected to the health of your brothers and sisters. Do you think it's possible to be a healthy Christian without the body of Christ? I know you kind of know where this is going, so you're like, no, right? (laughs) Do Do you think it's possible to be a healthy, to live a healthy Christian life on your own? Jesus didn't. The Apostle Paul didn't. You can be saved. You can read and, and grow intellectually. You can know, and you, but you will never live into all God made you to be. You'll never flourish the way he designed you to flourish without the body, his body. And that brings us uh, to the fourth point. As his body, we are the presence of Christ in the world. As his body, we are his presence in the world. Think about your physical body for just a minute. In fact, humor me, take your left hand and squeeze your right arm, right? I know it's weird, but it's fun to watch you do it, right? (laughs) And and give your your chin a little squeeze there, rub your whiskers if you have them, or now tug the ear of the person next to you. No, don't do that, right? (laughs) Like, your physical body 
The, the flesh is the way you interact in the world. We inhabit a physical body. I've been given this body, and you've been given your body, and sometimes we hate our bodies, right? But we've been given this physical body with all of its imperfections, still to represent and glorify God, and to interact in the world, to serve with our hands, to talk with our mouths. I used to pray this little benediction prayer for my kids when they were little. Um, it was something I've picked up from somebody else and added to over the years. They'd lay on their bed at night, and I would say, Dear Lord Jesus, bless Noah's eyes to see your glory, and I would touch his eyes. His lips to speak your truth, right? his mouth to speak your truth, his heart to be your home, his hands to do your work, right? grab his hands, you know, his knees to bow before you, and his little feet to follow you all the days of his life, and I tickle his feet, and, you know. When they were the, one time Ben was like, Dad, do eyes, ears, and nose in Jesus. And he's like, you know, right? It became like a little ritual. But as a dad, I meant it. I want, you know, our bodies are the way we interact in the world, the way we engage with the world. God intended it that way. How do you think Jesus interacts in the world today? Just woo, floating around. Like, how does he do it? Through his word, yes. Someone's got to speak it and share it. Through his spirit, of course. But most of the way the spirit works is in the hearts of his people, prompting us to do things and say things. Like, we, we as the, if, you're, if this is serious, this is not just a, you know, an interesting image. If, if Jesus means this, we're his body, we are the way Jesus interacts in the world as members of his body, extensions of him. Think about that. Look at verse 12 again one more time. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. He has a body and we're it. You know, the church in Corinth, if you've studied the New Testament, you probably know this, but in case you don't, that's okay. The church in Corinth, they had a lot of issues. Like that was not a, if you had attended that church and, and, got, and got to know some people, you might go, whoa, these people have got some, they're kind of a hot mess. Like there was infighting, there were, there were lawsuits between members of the church, there was sexual immorality rampant, there was political division, racial, racial division, hierarchies we'd already talked about. Like they had some issues. And I, that encourages me, <laughs> in a way, <laughs> because we've got issues. We, we at Chapel Street, have some, have some issues. And that, I don't mean like, I just mean it's not unique to us. And yet, what, what, what God says to the church in Corinth, he says to us, which is, I'm, you're still my body. I'm not disconnecting from you. You are connected to me. You are the members of my body. When you think of the historical failures of the church throughout history, man, it's amazing that Jesus stays connected to us. But he does because of his covenant faithfulness. And that's bride. That's next week. But we're his body. For all of our imperfections, all of our infighting, all of our issues, all of our weaknesses, all of our brokenness, we remain his body in the way he interacts in the world. We're still connected. Or more accurately, he's still connected to us. That's so encouraging to me. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian and pastor. He was part of a plot to overthrow Hitler and was put in prison and hung, uh, executed for his part in that plot. Um, profound uh, thinker, and theologian, wrote a ton in his young life, even, even from prison. And he wrote a book called Life Together, which outlines his view of what the what Christian community, the church really is. And here's what he says in part of that book. The church is not a religious community of worshipers of Christ. You might think, well, yeah, it is. No, not really. But Christ himself, who has taken form among his people. The church is not something you attend. It's not a collection of people singing songs and getting some inspiration for the week. It is Christ himself taking form among his people. Jesus Christ is present in the world through his people. I heard this story years ago. I, I don't know if it's a true story. It's probably a pastor's story. And I, I don't always tell those, but I like it. And I, and I hope it's true. It's a story about a little boy who's, a, who's afraid at night to fall asleep. And I like the story because my wife came to know Jesus when she was afraid one night. And her dad came in and shared the gospel with her and prayed with her. Anyway, a little boy's in his room, afraid to fall asleep. His dad comes in and says, son, don't be afraid. God loves you. Go to sleep. 
Boy cries out again, Daddy, I'm afraid. Comes back in, Son, don't be afraid. God is with you. God loves you. Now go to sleep. This goes on and on. Like the fifth or sixth time, Dad stands in the doorway, Son, God loves you. You're not alone. He's with you. Now don't be afraid. Go to sleep. And the little boy says, Daddy, I know God loves me, but right now I need somebody with skin on. <laughs> I hope that, yes, it's funny. Once upon a time, God loves so much, the world so much that he put skin on. We call that the incarnation. He took on flesh and dwelt among us. And Paul is saying, the New Testament is telling us, he still does. He still has skin on through his body, through us. We are his skin on in the world for people who need it, for one another, and for those who don't know him. I'm going to close by reading to you a poem written in the 15th century by Teresa of Avila. The title of the poem is Christ Has No Body But Yours. I'll read it over you, to us, and we'll pray. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the head of your body, the church, and we are all members of it. With all of our weaknesses and imperfections and struggles and our strengths, the things we're proud of and ashamed of, you've made us part of your body. And you can use all of it for your glory. And each of us has a part to play. Lord, for those that are here and think they have nothing to offer, remind them it is not true. If you called them, you arranged them in the body for your purpose and glory. And for those of us who have drifted and become disconnected, Lord, remind us that there is no life apart from the body to be connected to you. We will not be who you made us to be, Lord, without your body. Thank you for this vision. We confess that we, we do not live up to it. Help us by your grace to live into it for our sake and for the sake of the world and ultimately for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I, I love that song for lots of reasons, especially the chorus. Your goodness is running after me. David said that in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. You ever stop and think that God's goodness is chasing you? Maybe stop running from him. Now, uh, if you need prayer for any reason, if you'd like to come forward or go to the prayer room, we have prayer team members every week that would just love to encourage you and to pray for you and commit to supporting you in that way. Brothers and sisters, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. May his goodness pursue you individually and corporately, now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.